That's cool. All right. I will zoom There we go. Welcome. <laughs> All right. So um, I know that not everybody can be here with us this morning. And so uh, we'll record the meeting. Again, I'll, I'll put a link of it um, for you, for those of you who can't be here live, that you guys can see it later. But it's great to see you guys. Um, I see Jonathan and, and Frank out there and Gabe and Luke should be there somewhere. So it's really good to see you guys. Um, I hope everybody is healthy and safe. Um, give me a couple of shout outs to let me know you're, you're okay if you can, if you got your microphone turned on. I'm good. I'm good. Good deal. Doing fine. Good deal. I'm good. Right on. Well, it's, it's really good to see you guys. Um, so today's lesson is going to be on carburetors and how to select the right carburetor if that's what you're looking to do, how to do some tuning on the carburetor, and then to give you some resources. And we're going to relate it back to last week's lesson on flow bench testing. But before we do um, any of that stuff, I need to talk about um, what, what's going to happen with our class uh, in the future. So I think what I will do is I will put our um, document camera back up. That's what this, this thing is right here. And um, just so I have something I can scribble down some notes on. Um, one of the questions I asked you guys on the announcements was who was interested in coming back to the school at, um, at a later time and doing the hands-on part, right? And if you haven't had a chance to respond to me, please do, because basically I'm gonna share a list of, of names that are all the folks looking for um, shop time. The other thing I'm going to do, oops, the red doesn't, you can't see that at all, that's interesting. Let's try a different color. Same thing. Same thing. Oh, that's garbage. Okay. Let's, uh, yeah. so we will stick with, all right. Interesting. We can see purple. Kind of. All right. Let's, um, maybe it's just in a glare zone. I think it is in the glare zone. There it is. Yeah. But, Let's get rid of the let's get rid of the glare zone because we don't have to use a whiteboard. Uh, we have paper technology, <laughs> so we can uh, we can use that. Um, so I just wanted you guys to know that that one of the things that I am looking to do is I'm I'm adding up the number of hours. These would be the number of hours that we had of lab that were left for the semester. Um, from basically, we stopped class on 318. So I'm gonna add up those hours, and I'm also gonna look at what's in our curriculum related to your student learning outcomes, or SLOs. And from that, we're gonna figure out some type of, of number of hours. Let's say it's, I don't know, 30 hours or 40 hours, but we'll come up with some type of um, number of hours. And our goal is to set up some type of 100% lab, um, you know, boot camp option. So when the shop opens back up, you guys can come in and get your hands on lab time. And, and so that's going to be happening for, for all the hands-on type courses. I will be, I, I will say I'm, I'm working with two campuses right now, both American River College and Sierra College. And uh, Sierra College is actually a little further ahead in the game on this, um, but I'm using what they're doing to kind of shape what we're going to do here. And I just want you to know that, that, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to, um, you know, to figure out the number of hours and, and to make it right for you. And it's, you know, it's, it's a hard situation. Um, uh, there's no, 
there's no schools right now that that teach auto that you know we're, we're all in the same same boat right like even uti uh, has had to go to online um, instruction for the time being um, initially we thought that after spring break we would get back into the shop and currently that's looking like it's less and less of a possibility um, so we might finish the semester um, we might finish spring and do our boot camp class maybe in um, May or June but you guys have to understand there's a lot of stuff we don't we don't know is going to happen out there um, and so it all de depends on the California Department of Education and those um, state and federal guidelines as to what um, what they're going to allow the school to do as far as hands-on makeup work. So um, I just wanted to, to let you guys know where we're at and we're, I'm working with the administration and everybody's doing their best, but ultimately the school, the college is going to have to follow the regulations put in place by the, by the government, right? They're not going to say the heck with you government. We're just going to let kids back in or, and we pitched a couple different ideas. Um, of trying to get it more one-to-one -one so there was less person-to-person uh, -person content contact um, and so they're they're looking at that but it really depends on what those guidelines are so I just wanted you guys to know that we are we are looking at that and trying our best to um, get you you know get that hands-on lab time made up until then we'll, we'll be doing our best to cover all the lecture information and uh, with that, I want you to know that I'm, uh, my goal is to not make it more difficult uh, for you. Um, I had a good comment, and, and by the way, if, if I've, I've opened up the, the a our ARC Tuner Canvas page, if we go to discussions, thank you everybody for those who have um, uh, participated in some discussions. Right, so I asked you guys, how do you learn online? And I had some good uh, responses and tried to get to most everybody's um, responses. And I thought um, Susan made a good comment. She, Susan said, I don't really like online classes because there's usually a lot more homework, right? And Susan, um, if, if you're out there, I, I do agree with you. I've taken online classes myself and uh, it's, it's a killer with all the online homework. So I'm going to try to my best not to kill you with a bunch of stuff. Um, I am going to give you some tests online, but all I'm doing guys is I've taken the test I would normally give you in class and I'm taking the same thing and I'm cutting it up and putting it online. So it's, it's not going to be any more work. So the only thing that's going to make this more academically difficult is now you're trying to do stuff through a computer um, but all in all um, it, you know uh, difficulty wise I'm not coming up with extra homework assignments to, to kill you okay so um, with that out of out of the way I do want to say that when you're on uh, canvas and I'll go back to our course wait dashboard you can tell okay so I'll go back to our course here um, that each week I'll, I'll post you know announcements for you to look at so be sure to read the announcements and the announcements will prompt you to say hey maybe you need to go and check out an assignment or and and I mentioned the tests these two tests I've, I've loaded them on here um, I would not even worry about them or start on them yet basically these the, these two tests were kind of like your your midterm and final and i'm just i i'm putting them online for you but i would go from announcements check out assignments and there'll be some stuff on the discussions boards for you to comment on and just just kind of feel that like you're involved like you're like you you know we're out there we're still trying to to learn about engines and engine tuning and um then if you click the modules tab, what you can see is a whole bunch of information like the workbook that each one of you guys already has. I did load the PDFs of that for you. 
And this is what um, some of you guys, I've sent it to you in the mail, but maybe some of you folks are like, yeah, you know, I can read it off my computer just the same. I'm fine. Um, I loaded the second half of that workbook on there. I've also been loading my presentations and I don't have them all loaded on here yet. Um, but I'm getting those loaded on and also the notes pages uh, that correspond to them. So for instance, the carburetors, uh, uh, basics of carburation notes page, oops, I don't want to see my email. There it is, um, is right here on carburation basics. I have some supplemental information of flow bench, uh, flow benches and dynamometers and EFI tuning and other resources. Um, and I'll be loading some more stuff on here. So this is this is under your modules tab where you have all this this information. Now if um, if you want to email me, let's see, go to home. I think I'm trying to go to home. Assignments there. Let me click this thing real quick and see if I can get him moved over. Okay, now I can select the home page. And I'm also going to throw it in student view. So hopefully, um, there's a pink bar along the bottom here. So this should look more like, other than I guess the pink bar, this should more look more like the format that you guys see it. Um, hey, would you guys give me a comment? Is this is this kind of looking, does my screen more match what you guys see on Canvas now? Other than maybe the pink color? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Announcements, people, that link that you sent us didn't work for me. It did not. What? Which? Um, okay. So wait a minute. Let me go back to announcements. Um, the one from this morning. The one from this morning, or the one from Wednesday as well. For the for the Zoom. Correct. That this one I'm highlighting. Um, so when you I click on it, it doesn't work or did you have to like, cause you made it here. So tell me how you made it here. How'd you get to the right spot? Uh, the phone number, but I would kind of like to see what you're presenting. So interesting. Doesn't work. Uh, it worked for me, but last Wednesday I tried it just to see what it did and it didn't work. And I had to copy paste it and then it got me to the zoom page. But this morning, whatever it was, I just clicked on it and I, was able to participate. Huh. Yeah, this this thing should have worked. I did. Um, but here's here's right. one thing that's kind of weird. See how my um, you can't see I it. Can't. You're on the phone. Um, yeah. So um, the link is set up where you can either like the first part of it, you should be able to click. In fact, I'm going to try it. Yeah, and it's trying to open up a Zoom. All right, I'll um, get home. But the second part, you had to you had to copy oh it. So God. I tried to put it on there two in two formats, but um, that is the challenge with technology. Um, if uh, what I would recommend is just kind of uh, messing with it and see if you can do it, or just kind of listen on the line. Remember what I will do is I will save this video and post it um, later. Um, I, I did try to double check this, but I'll tell you like sometimes I'll go in, in this garage here and my computer works perfectly and other times it doesn't work at all. For instance, last night I was doing my Sierra College class and I couldn't get it to record our presentation. And so what I actually had to do was um, start a whole new um, start a whole new webinar. So, um, so I, I apologize for that. I don't know quite know what the answer is, but um, this thing is listed on here twice. The first part of it, you can click on. It's a link. If that doesn't work, you should be able to um, copy 
where it starts with HTTPS, you should be able to copy that part and throw it in an address bar and get it to open. Um, all right. Uh, regardless, I am, I'm really happy that, you know, you guys made it. I was trying to get to, let's see, I got chat. Why am I having, guys, you guys help me out because now I'm, I'm having a, a memory fade here. Oh, I right want, here. how do you, where do you go to email me? I um, thought there was a thing. I usually go to people. Okay. So if I go to people and it, it should be like up here or something. And then I would find oh, no, your name right. and then click it. Okay. So if we wanted to email Jennifer. Because they usually would have a link there. Okay. Oh, you know what? And because I'm in my mock student view, that's why it's not showing it. Okay. Um, but yeah, you should be able to to email me directly through Canvas, and it will come right up in my little inbox right here, which it's that I mean that because I'm in uh, student view. But um, uh, I can try to send you send you one to see how if it works properly. Sure, sure, that would be great. Okay, and I'll open our course back up. All right. Okay, so while um, while we're doing that, I'm going to open up today's uh, presentation on carburetors. And uh, with this one, um, you know, we're we're fortunate in that I I have. I, I stole some carburetors from the school and then I had a bunch of carburetor stuff sitting around here at my house. So we should be able to do a pretty darn decent job covering this, this uh, area. So with that, we'll get, we'll get into it. I'm going to minimize the chat here and hopefully get the slideshow up. There we go. Um, all right. Basics of carburation. And of course, we have a beautiful looking holly there on the screen. Um, and we're going to just get get through some of the, the basics and then, and get in, and then get into um, choosing the right carburetor and the calculations related to that. We're also going to then relate this to using your flow bench. Um, and then we're going to pull it back and go through each carburetor circuit. Right. So. Um, see if I can annotate. So what's the, what's the job of the carburetor? That carburetor is there to, um, the carburetor is there to deliver the correct amount of air and fuel. And of course it has to do this under all operating conditions. Now, how does a carburetor do that? It basically just knows volume and pressure, right? There's no sensors there involved. Um, it knows how much airflow is going through it, right? And that sets up a pressure drop. So it's, it's a pretty basic, uh, you know, mechanical de device. Um, but amazingly, a carburetor can do a pretty good job of giving you a decent air fuel ratio and making, making power. Let's get rid of some of these scribbles from the previous page. So um, there's some formulas here to determine the right size of the carburetor. And to do that, and this is, I, I kind of call this the, the Hawley formula, you need to know the maximum, the maximum, you know, horsepower RPM, right? Like where do you think your engine is going to make the most amount of horsepower. Guys, by the way, this engine on the screen, is this a Chevy or is this guy a Ford? That seems like a Ford engine. Yeah, good job. It is a Ford engine. Distributors in the front, so that's your that's your big giveaway on that thing, right? You can also if you look at the way the exhaust ports are set up, but 
yeah. And it's also Ford Blue, but yeah, good deal. Um, so we need to know, you know, what RPM we think we're going to be making our most amount of horsepower at. We need to know the displacement, cubic inches of displacement of the engine. And then we're going to take this number, 3456. Now, where do we get that number? We get that number from calculating out one um, cubic foot, right? So what is one cubic foot? Well, it's 1,728 cubic inches. Now, remember this engine in a four-stroke cycle, well, you guys tell me how many revolutions does the crankshaft have to make for a complete four-stroke cycle? Two. Yeah. So we're going to – really hard to write the word stroke there. Um, we're mm -hmm. going to multiply that by two uh, because we're doing two revolutions of the crankshaft. And so if we do that, we can figure out what our, um, what our CFM we need from our carburetor is. So um, this thing does assume, this formula does bring into some, some assumptions about volumetric efficiency, right? Remember that volumetric efficiency or, or VE, right, is a percentage of how much air actually enters the, the engine, right? So if we had a 350 cubic inch Chevrolet, let's say, and if it had 100% volumetric efficiency, it, in a four-stroke cycle, it would move through it 350 cubic inches of, of air, basically, right? But we know that most engines don't get to be 100% volumetric efficiency they might be 70% or they might be 80% or 85%, right? So we have a compensation for this in the formula and the idea is to use a realistic, realistic number for that. Um, so with that, let me switch this back to the mouse and what we're gonna do is throw up my document camera again. And I put that formula up here on the screen. And that's, um, we take the engine cubic inches of displacement. And, uh, oh, by the way, I'm wearing, I'm wearing our mechanics gloves because I'll be handling some parts and it's freezing cold in my garage. So it's a little bit of warmth. So anyways, they're not my coronavirus gloves. They're just because of the, the coldness in here. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so we're taking the engine cubic inches of displacement. We're, multi or, or we're multiplying that by, by the maximum RPM that we think the engine will be spinning. And then we're, we're, we're dividing that by 3456. And that should tell us how many CFM we're looking for on the carburetor that we're going to choose. And if we just stop the formula over there, right there, we're, we're assuming we have 100% volumetric efficiency. But if we don't think we're going to have 100% volumetric efficiency, what we can do then is then after we get this number is multiply it by a percentage. So here's, here's an example I stole from, uh, um, from Holly. They took a 406 cubic inch motor at 6,500 RPM. They multiplied those together and they got, uh, what is it, 2,639,000 uh, right there, they divide it by 3456 and they came up with 764 CFM. So if you kind of rounded that down, that would mean, okay, well, I would want a, a carburetor that's rated at 750 CFM, cubic feet per minute. That would get me there. But again, this is assuming 100% volumetric efficiency. If I thought, well, I have really a, a well-built street engine that's, I think, running at 85% volumetric efficiency. Then I could take that number, that 750, multiply it by 0.85, right, for 85%, and I'm going to come up with 637. We could round that up and select then a 650 CFM carburetor for our engine. 
And, you know, if, if we thought, hey, maybe our volumetric fit efficiency is not even 0.85, maybe it's not 85%, maybe it's 70 or 80%, maybe a 600 CFM carburetor would run a little bit better. Um, so that's, that's how you can, that's a formula of how you can calculate what, um, what size carburetor, hang on a sec, what size carburetor that you would use um, for your engine. All right. Um, again, if we start messing around with stuff, stuff starts changing. For instance, I have a typical uh, stock engine here has, you know, 70 to 75%. If I build it up really good, maybe I'm getting to 85%. Um, however, if I do forced induction, which will be one of our topics here coming up, um, which would be turbocharging or supercharging, right? Then I can get over my 100% volumetric efficiency, right? Then I'm, I'm basically forcing more air in the engine and that's how I get over 100%. And that would then require me to have a larger carburetor if I was running, uh, let's say a, a, a carburetor with the supercharger or a carburetor with the turbocharger, something like that. So in that case, would you just go ahead and times that over 100% to that yeah. number and then get the bigger size? That's exactly it, Frank. You would you could just multiply it by 100%, right? Or, or you could multiply it by 1.1, uh, um, whatever you think you're going to get to as far as, um, as far as, uh, uh, volumetric efficiency. Um, so potentially how much a supercharger would it give it more than a hundred percent? Not much. Well, so that, so that's where it gets a little complicated because it depends on what, what how much boost pressure you're going to run. Right. Um, if we were running 15 PSI, 15 pounds of boost, in theory, that would double the volumetric efficiency. So let's say your volumetric efficiency was 80%. Well, now your VE would be 160%. But what happens as you compress air? As you compress it, it heats up and expands. So you might realistically be at 130% volumetric efficiency. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a great question though. Um, and other things tend to happen when you go too big on your carburetor. So you still are going to have to compromise a little bit. Um, so here I, I typed out the formula, right? Carburetor CFM, right? Selecting the, the and this is the CFM rating on the carburetor. Um, and we'll get into how, how they get into that in a minute. So like they'll rate, this is a 600 CFM carburetor or a 800 CFM carburetor. So how do I figure out that carburetor CFM? I do that by uh, engine displacement times the maximum power RPM divided by 3456. And then I can multiply that by whatever volumetric efficiency I think my engine's gonna have. And so you can see it is a little bit of an educated guess. Um, I did the math again with the 350 cubic inch Chevrolet engine with the VE of 80, 85% and I figured 6,800 RPM. Um, and I have, will it operate well with the 600 CFM car? Well, if you do the math on that, right? 350, 6,800 divided by the 3450, uh, you come up with 585 CFM. Oops, so uh, 600 CFM carburetor should work pretty good on that thing. Now, the thing with all carburetors though, is they are going to need some tuning to get them to work correctly, right? That gets us in the ballpark. Real quick, Professor, so yeah. is that the max RPM that's listed or do you want to do it to where it's yellow, you know, before you hit red line or? That would be the RPM that you think the engine will be making the most amount of power. That's right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, I have some, I have some links here and I'll post these on, uh, in canvas somewhere. I just added these to the presentation. Um, and, uh, I will get them 
linked up on your Canvas page. Let me exit out of this presentation for a minute because I did already load these links. So, um, hello everybody, hang on a minute. I didn't want to do that, I wanted to go. So one of the links is Holly's video on how to choose a carburetor and I'll put a, a link for this on there. Pretty decent, pretty decent video. Um, also, if you go to Holly's webpage, it shows a whole bunch of their carburetor designs. Um, and what's, uh, what's pretty interesting is if you go to the bottom, there's this thing called the carburetor selector. And you can input, you can input some stuff in this and let's see if it comes up with the same results, if it's running that same formula. And before I get into that though, let's, let's do one, one other thing here. Um, guys, do me a favor. Do me a favor, guys. If you have your, um, I'll start it. If you have your microphones on, go ahead and turn your microphones off for me. For some reason, I'm getting I'm getting a lot of feedback here through the screen. Let's see. All right, there's everybody. Um, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm trying to see who's got. Oh, none of the microphones look like they're on. I don't know what's going on. Somehow we're getting just a little bit of feedback. Anyways, I will um, I will minimize this and we'll go back to our our presentation. So I was at the Holly webpage. Let's do that same that same math. Um, and see if we if we get we if we get come up with the same number. So let's say we're going to take um, the 350 Chevy, and we're looking for a um, four barrel. I'll say mildly modified gasoline. We'll go with vacuum secondaries, electric chokes. Let's see what they got for us. Interesting. So they came up with 680 CFM um, and then a lot of 750s. Let's go, let's go back. And I'm gonna change this to stock. And let's see those results. Okay, there we go. That, now we're getting back into about 600 CFM range. Um, so you can kind of see how, how their selection thing basically does follow that same formula. Um, they ask about the uh, modification. One of the things that they want to know is what, um, what camshaft would you be running in that engine? And um, you know, how good are the, the cylinder heads and that type of thing? Um, because Obviously, if, if you start to modify it, that's going to improve the volumetric efficiency, right? So, all right. Um, Eldebrock on their website, which was one of the other links, has some, some good information with their tuning guide that would apply to their carburetors as well as car, Carter carburetors. Um, and they have some videos on their site as well. So there is some good links and information for you guys available um, to help you select the right carburetor. Let's get inside the carburetor systems and then we'll see why selecting the, a, a carburetor that's too big can cause your problems. Um, so six systems of the carburetor, float, idle, main metering, power pump and choke. And for this, I need to, looking for my tools here. And nowhere, let's see, share screen, 
Holes, breakout rooms, more. Hmm. Somehow I lost my annotation tools, guys. You can use these annotation tools, though. All right, we got something that, that I have multiple sets of things going on here with the Elmo document camera, the Zoom meeting. We're just going to go with what works. All right, so flow idle main metering, power pump and choke, six carburetor systems. Will every carburetor have all six systems? No, okay. In fact, um, you may not have some of these, especially as you get to the small engine stuff you might not have, and, and the two that are commonly not found on like smaller engines are gonna be the uh, uh, power enrichment system and the accelerator pump system. But most everything will have flow idle main metering and they'll have some type of choke valve on there. There is some uh, small engine carburetors that on the real cheap pieces of equipment that they might not even have an idle circuit because they, they never idle. So with that being said, Let's let's jump into this stuff. Um, let's see. I'll use this eraser. How's that working? Can you guys see my screen? No. Okay. You guys cannot see my screen. No. You're just seeing my ugly face, huh? I see everyone's face. You see everyone's yeah. face. Yeah. No, you can face is your face. Okay, that's that's good to know. All right, so I got to figure this out. Hang on a second. Um, what changed? There we There's go. It. Share, Share screen. screen. There we go. How about that, guys? Yep. All right. So here's uh, here's a tip. <laughs> here's a tip. If this thing starts screwing up again, you guys got to let me know, right? Because I got fifty windows of different things, and so. Um, Gosh, I apologize, gentlemen. Let's let's back up a bit. Um, so I showed you these links. Uh, I'm going to put those links on your Canvas webpage. They're pretty. It's pretty good information for choosing the right carburetor. Um, one of our discussion questions this week will be, to, you know, basically, well, can I make more power with the carburetor, or can I make more power with fuel injection, and what the advantage disadvantage is um, um, so six systems in a carburetor can you guys see that on the screen yes yes okay beautiful beautiful so what's going on all right um, so we're gonna jump in the basic functions of the carburetor and that is to meter the right amount of air with the fuel that's going in the engine atomize it, which means break it up into fine little droplets um, that gives you more air contact and distribute it. Now, let me back up for a minute. Why do we need to atomize it? Because we need it to turn into a vapor, right? Um, gasoline does not burn in liquid form. It has to be vaporized in order to burn. So if I atomize it, break it up into little droplets, if I do a good job with that, it turns into a vapor really easily um, versus if it stays in liquid form, a lot of the fuel is not going to get burned. And the intake manifold and the rest of that induction system is going to have a harder time distributing an even mixture, a uniform mixture to each cylinder. So if I do a poor job atomizing, distribution becomes a problem and what you end up with is some cylinders getting more fuel than others or some cylinders running richer and other cylinders running leaner, right? So the basic functions of a carburetor and really any fuel delivery system for that matter, right? Whether it's fuel injection or carburetion is to meter the right amount of fuel with the right amount of air that's going in the engine, atomize it properly and distribute it to where it needs to go um, so that every cylinder in that engine gets the correct amount of air with the correct amount of fuel. All right, um, we have talked about some of this stuff before, but there's limits on our metering, right? Um, in that if we go too lean, the engine's likely to stall out, not enough fuel. 
And if we go too rich, again, it can stall out. It's going to foul out spark plugs. It's going to wash the oil off the cylinder walls of the engine and cause more wear. Um, so somewhere about 15 to 1 is our overall best mixture, right? That's, that's where we, where we want to be. And these slides, by the way, these old slides, this was from an old General Motors training uh, video, or sorry, not video, an old General Motors training manual um, on carburation from like the 1950s. And so it was pretty interesting, even back then, they knew that their best mixture was about 15 to one. We now know today that more precisely, we want our stoichiometric mixture for gasoline, which happens to be 14.7 to one, right? Um, we also know that this best mixture varies depending upon what fuel uh, we're gonna run in the engine. So here's my question for you guys. If we were gonna run E85, right, ethanol, if I'm running ethanol-based fuel, what is my overall best mixture, stoichiometric mixture come uh, become for E85? Higher. Yeah, it's somewhere around nine to one. So we're, we have to give it a lot more fuel because essentially there's more air already mixed in chemically with the fuel. So there's limits to metering, right? And the job of the carburetor is to hopefully get our mixture in the green zone here under all its different operating conditions. Let's get it back to a mouse. There we go. No, nope. mouse. All right. Um, so this is just a nice shot of the transition, vaporization, atomization, and it's kind of like your classic um, inline six cylinder uh, intake manifold and how you would always end up with on, the, on those engines, uh, cylinders that ran lean and ran rich um, on those types of engines and how, how important on a carbureted engine, the intake manifold design is arguably more important because it's moving both fuel and air. Right, and we don't want fuel to puddle up in the um, in the corners of the manifold and cause the engine to run richer uh, for some cylinders than other cylinders. All right, distribution again. We were talking about that, so I'm going to get into these basic carburetor systems. We'll erase some of these scribbles. And these would, you know, this diagram here is basically outlining our major components. Um, one thing that we talked about last week uh, when we were going over the flow benches is we talked about the Venturi. And so you can see this narrow section of the carburetor and how if I take this piece right here and I just outline that, it looks like an airplane wing, right? And that's what we're gonna to use to speed up the airflow inside the middle uh, of the carburetor. That, that airflow speeds up, remember it causes a pressure drop inside the middle and that's what causes the fuel to come from the float bowl and be delivered inside the carburetor. So just a little bit ago, I was beating up with choosing the right carburetor for your engine. And I said, hey, if, if you ch chose a carburetor that was too big, you could have some problems, right? Well, what this gets to is that I want to make sure that this carburetor, right, this, this Venturi area here is in a choke point, right? If I have my engine down here and that engine needs a lot of airflow, right, it needs a lot of air. Well, if I don't choose a big enough carburetor, that means that this Venturi itself is going to be choking down how much airflow the, the engine can receive and it will be reducing the car, uh, reducing the power of the engine because the Venturi is basically acting as a restriction, right? It's restricting how much airflow the engine can take in. Um, so if I go too small of a carburetor, I'm not going to make as much horsepower, right? That thing becomes a, a restriction and it would be like the engine's trying to suck air through a straw, essentially. Um, however, on the other side of this, let's say 
that I have uh, a real, you know, a real tiny engine down here that doesn't need a bunch of airflow. Maybe my engine only really needs 600 CFM. And I just put a carburetor on here that was a Holly, I don't know, maybe a double pumper or something that could do that was an 800 CFM. So now my Venturi area is way too big. Well, the engine's not going to be drawing enough airflow through it, especially at lower vehicle and engine speeds. If I don't have my throttle opened up a whole lot, it may not be drawing enough airflow through here to get enough pressure drop to cause an adequate amount of fuel to be delivered. And so what happens when you, when you over carbureted an engine, you put in a carburetor that's just too big on there, you're likely to have really poor drivability at lower vehicle speeds in that you know, if you're wide open throttle on the racetrack, it might run pretty good. Um, in fact, it might even make more power at that speed. But if you're trying to drive it around town, it's miserable. It's, it's, it's bucking and snorting and stalling and um, just doesn't give you the right air fuel mixture at lower speeds because the Venturi area is too, is too large. So what we're doing when we're doing those calculations to choose the right carburetor is try to come up with something that's gonna give us decent low speed drivability, but not sacrifice horsepower at the high end of the scale. And this diagram kind of shows you a little, little bit of that, so. All right, I'm gonna turn it back to the uh, presentation and I'll get rid of some of these things and we're going to get into our first carburetor system and that is the float system. So the one thing about the float system is that the float will affect all the other carb systems. So if I put some scribbles on there I will say it impacts It impacts, I know I can do, all systems. Um, because what happens here is the fuel comes in from our fuel delivery system. It comes in and the float regulates how much fuel actually enters the carburetor and ends up in the float bowl. So, you can see that there's a level here between how much fuel is in this little bowl area of the carburetor in the float bowl. Um, and if I adjust the float by bending the actual, the little tang on the actual float here, and I make this fuel level go up to a higher value, that's gonna make everything run richer. It's gonna make everything deliver more fuel. If I adjusted this where now the fuel level is down here, let's say, I'll erase some of this other stuff, that's gonna make everything run leaner. So why did I say, hey, it impacts all the systems? Because the float level really, it, it's where the fuel gets temporarily stored on its way to going other places. If I make the float level higher, it makes everything richer. If I make it lower, it makes everything leaner. So if the float level is not set correctly, it will impact all the other systems of the, of the carburetor. Um, it works off of this uh, needle and seat here. And so it is one of the things that you would commonly replace on a carburetor rebuild is you would change out that needle and possibly the seat area because this is a wear point. You might um, replace the actual float and the float is just like a little, little boat in there. It, it actually floats on top of the fuel and regulates how far the needle goes in the seat to regulate that a uh, uh, float bowl fuel level. Now some carburetors will have a window on the side of their float bowl where you can look in there and you could see what the fuel level is on the inside. Um, that was pretty popular in some of the Asian carburetors. Uh, I know on the, the stock carburetor on, on our RX-7s like that, a lot of your older Toyotas. Um, a lot of other designs to figure out your float level, you have to take this all apart and actually physically measure 
what the, the fuel level is or what the float level is uh, on your rebuild. So you're doing a rebuild, change that needle, change the seat too if, if, you, if it has a replaceable seat insert and you want to make sure that the actual floats do just that, that they float because sometimes these floats will spring a leak and when they spring a leak, the float is then going to uh, sink. It's going to Titanic right to the bottom of the bowl and then this thing's going to run way too rich um, and you're likely to have fuel overflowing out of the float bowl vent. Now, um, I know that I have a few motorcycle riders in this class, right? Speak up a few uh, if you ride dirt bikes and if you've ever dropped your dirt bike or motorcycle on its side and had fuel flow out on the ground. Anybody had that happen before? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> For a minute, I was like, "Oh no, I lost everybody." All right. Um, yeah. And and hey, Frank, I will uh, record a record a, um, a thing of your bike run, and I'll listen to it this week, and we'll figure out what's going on with that. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, so, if you're riding, uh, usually a dirt bike, right? It gets real expensive if you're dropping over your street bike. But if you if you fall over on the side of the trail, it's pretty common that you see fuel drip out on the ground, which is uh, one of the things that environmental folks don't necessarily like about people riding dirt bikes. Um, but what, why, why does that happen? Well, I have this float bowl vent right here. And the idea is that um, I have to let air into the float bowl area so that as the fuel flows out and goes through my Venturi or any of my other carburetor circuits, it takes a little bit for the fuel to come in from my fuel delivery system. So I have to provide a vent there so that the pressures and stuff can, can equalize and I don't have this thing starved for fuel. If I plugged up the float bowl vent with my finger, what would happen is I would uh, basically have a, a, an engine that ran a little bit and then it would shut off. It would literally run out of fuel because it couldn't get the fuel out of the float bowl. So if you flop over your motorcycle on the side of the trail, um, the fuel will uh, spill out of the float bowl vent. And a lot of motorcycles, they'll actually attach little hoses to the bowl vent and, and run them to the bottom of the bike to, to basically direct where that fuel is going to go. Um, so you have to have some type of a float bowl vent, okay, super important. And if this float bowl vent were to be plugged, the, the, the engine would act just like it ran out of fuel because essentially it would be running out of fuel because it couldn't get the fuel out of the float bowl. Now sometimes the float bowl vents are external, <laughs> like the one drawn here, and other times the float bowl vents are internal. And there's some differences on that. Now I heard a, a question, go ahead. Okay, so sometimes if I left my uh, bike sitting for maybe a few months or something like that, I go ahead and I <clears throat> turn on the gas from the tank and it'll immediately start dripping down out the tubes. Is there something getting stuck or clogged up in the car? Yeah. Um, likely you have w one of two things happening. So you're saying you turn your gas on right, the little pet cock on the, on the bottom of your gas tank and it starts pouring out on the, on the ground, likely what's happened is there's a little piece of junk. Well, let me make that a different color. Uh, there's a little piece of junk caught in the needle and seat area so that the, this thing's not closing off. So again, the fuel level just fills up and starts pulling out. Or the float is physically stuck right? So it can't, it, maybe it's stuck in a downward position and it can't raise up and then again, pinch off the, the fuel flow with the needle and seat. So what I will do in that instance is I'll take a little, little hammer um, or maybe the end of my screwdriver or something and I'll tap on the float bowl area or the side of the carburetor uh, to try to get that to stop. Sometimes after I fell over on the side of the trail, I'd have to take a little rock or something because my float might be sticking. 
So what you probably have is, is a stuck float, either stuck at the needle and seat or stuck at the float hinge that's, that's making that thing over overflow. And if you tap on it, it should stop. Um, Thanks. Yeah, good, good question. All right. Um, what we're going to do is let me erase some of these scribbles and let's look at some real float bowl vents real quick with the document camera. So I'm going to go like that and I'm going to go to the camera, I think. Go camera. Let's see. Let's try this again. Camera. Hey, there we go. Can you guys see the document camera? Yes. Okay. Yes. So we have a, a nice little holly here, and uh, the reason I brought it up is, see this little rubber pad? This area here behind it, this is, this is your float bowl area, okay? And so if I um, work the throttle and I let the throttle um, close completely, it opens up the bowl vent so that when it's sitting, the bowl vents open, which, um, and then if I open if I open up the throttle, this little thing closes down there. So that's that's my external bowl vent. But what I also wanted to point out, this carburetor has a float bowl here, also has a float bowl back there, and then you'll see that hey, there's these two big huge tubes coming up. Those are internal bowl vents. So if I bolted the air cleaner on, and I don't have the air cleaner for this, but if I bolted the air cleaner on, those bowl vents would be underneath the air cleaner opening, okay? Most carburetors today will not have an external bowl vent like this because what this is going to do, if he opens up, he's just letting gas vapors evaporate out of the carburetor, right? And environmentally, that's, that's not good. Um, so with this one, remember what, when, I, when my throttle's closed, he's letting the vapors vent. When I let, when I open up the throttle, he closes off, and and it's running off of the internal bowl vents. Okay, let's let's look at another um, carburetor design, and see if we can find his um, his bowl vents. So here we got a Elda Brock, and so this one's a little bit trickier as to where the heck are the bowl vents. The one thing you'll see is you don't notice an external bowl vent, right? But it does have some internal bowl vents and that's these passages here and here. So there are internal bowl vent inside the air cleaner area. And um, I guess I should back up a bit. Fuel enters from this fitting right here. This is a float bowl on this side of the carburetor and this is a float bowl on this side of the carburetor. Now you go, well, why isn't there a fitting right here? Well, this carburetor has an internal passage to take the fuel from this side to this side. So he has float bowls on each side and then there's the bowl vent for this side. Here's the bowl vent for the other side. So every float system has to have some type of vent. And if the vents were plugged off, well, the engine would literally run out of fuel. All right. Okay. Well, that's great. That's on a couple of big carburetors. What about a little carburetor? And so like Nathan and Jonathan, a lot of my small engine guys will like this. Um, here's a little carburetor off of a Honda uh, clone motor. My float bowl is this um, uh, uh, brass colored part on the bottom. I've taken that off and here I can see my actual float pontoon there and you can see how it it drops down and then it would raise up and it would plug the needle in the seat in fact I'll take the float hinge pin out of it there's my float and the needle and you can see that the needle has a rubber or a viaton tip to it and there is the seat to my float. Now, what about a float bowl vent? I was making a big deal about that. 
Um, if you look up in the carburetor here, there's some passageways. And if I roll this thing over here, what you'll notice is that there's a couple of holes here, right? Well, one of those holes goes uh, to your, your um, one of these holes. One of these holes goes to the, um, the idle circuit. It's your idle air bleed, but the other hole goes to the float system. So again, every carburetor is gonna have some type of float bowl vent. Most carburetors are gonna have the float bowl vent internal, not external. And um, it's important to make sure that those are, those are cleared in their, their own. All right, um, let's switch this back to the computer. And now that I'm back on the computer, I'll do one more thing on the float bowl vent deal, okay? Um, why would I have an internal float bowl vent versus an external vent? One of the things I said was to deal with emissions, right? Well, let, let me put an air cleaner assembly on this carburetor. So here's the air cleaner base. We'll put that real nice uh, K&N style air filter, and we'll even give it a nice uh, chrome air filter cover on the top. How about that? Okay. And I got this thing all screwed down there with my uh, wing nut there. There he is. He's all put together. So here's the, here's the problem. You're driving down the road, thousands of miles are going by, and the air filter starts to get clogged up full of a bunch of dirt, right? Well, if I have an external bowl vent, I'll get a difference in pressure. So let me pick a different color. I'll go with green. So remember, atmospheric pressure at sea level is about 15 PSI, right? So if I have my external bowl vent, I have 15 PSI pressing down there. But if I have a dirty air filter that's restricting airflow, well, I no longer have 15 PSI here. Maybe I only have 12 PSI or 11 PSI or 13 PSI because this air filter being clogged now is providing a restriction. And as air flows goes to flow in, some of that airflow is being restricted and I'm getting a little bit of a pressure drop through the air filter. So with this situation, you guys tell me, what do you think that would do to your air fuel mixture as the air filter got dirty? Um, the air fuel mixture would go down? It would, be richer. It, would get a lot, it would get a lot richer. Okay, so, because what would happen is essentially there's more pressure pushing the fuel into the engine than air going through the circuits. So essentially, I'm gonna start enriching that much more. So I will say that as air filters plug up, even if I have an internal bowl vent, as air filters plug up, uh, the mixture tends to go rich, right? Because we're restricting airflow. But the downside of an external bowl vent is they start going rich a lot faster than if I have internal bowl vents. Also, remember when the car's sitting, that fuel can then vaporize, right? Heat and vaporize and just go right out of the, the um, float bowl area out into the atmosphere. And so there's no, we're not trapping those vapors, which is a no-no as far as emissions is concerned, right? So most carburetors today, you're gonna look at, unless they're for a racing application like the Holly I had here, they're gonna have internal bowl vents. Um, some of your 1980s era cars that had computer controlled carburetors, they might even had, they might have had an external bowl vent, but it had a solenoid on it that would control what it did. And it would vent its, its vapors to the um, charcoal canister, to the EVAP canister. So float system, I have to have a good float, a good condition of my needle and seat. And that um, the tip of that seat, it is important that it's nice and uh, true, what will often happen is that, and I'm drawing this needle as uh, the tip of this needle in brown because a lot of these are viaton and the rubber of viaton is a, 
this kind of brown colored, but the needle will get like a little divot in it right there where it starts to wear and then it doesn't regulate the fuel flow as well into it. So anyways, needle and seat, uh, change that stuff out, uh, check your float, make sure that it actually floats. Um, some manufacturers will put down like, this is how much the float should weigh. So if this float started to fill up full of fuel, you could weigh that and figure out that the float was loaded. They call it loaded with fuel. All right, let's get rid of some of these scribbles. So I beat you up with the float circuit. Remember, it affects all the other circuits. So it's super critical that it is working correctly and it is adjusted correctly. So the so, mixture screws are more fine tuning type of stuff or? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll get to the mixture screws. G give me a minute. In fact, we're right there because the typical mixture screws that you see are for the idle circuit. So, so here's, here's the deal with the idle circuit. At low speeds, and let me, I don't know, change colors here. At low, uh, low engine speeds, low vehicle speeds, low amounts of airflow through the carburetor, I don't have enough airflow through the Venturi to make him do his job properly. So I rely on my idle circuit. Well, there's a low pressure area and I don't know, I'll just use the text tool and I'm gonna write low pressure. And you can't see it because I wrote it in blue. <laughs> Let's try that again and we'll put it in black. Low pressure. So there's a low pressure area down here. And so essentially, right, a, a, a vacuum. And that means that we're going to draw fuel through the different circuits of the carburetor into the engine, right? Well, it's not that the engine's sucking the fuel through the idle circuit. Remember, there's more pressure on the outside, I'll write that 15 PSI again, than there is down here. And so really it's this pressure forcing the fuel through. But at any regard, what happens is fuel goes from the float bowl area, right? It goes through an area called the main well and it gets picked up some idle tubes. It passes by a little hole here, a little port called the idle air bleed. What's that air bleed do? It just starts mixing up some air with the fuel so we can atomize that fuel a little bit. Then the fuel flows below the throttle plate, usually past some type of a mixture screw and it gets discharged below the throttle plate. And mm -hmm. that's, your, that's your idle circuit. Now this picture over here is a zoomed in part of right here. And what it's showing is that as I open up my throttle, I'm gonna uncover additional off idle ports that can then allow more fuel to flow out of my idle circuit to kind of smooth the transition between idle operation, right? To off idle operation to ultimately my main metering circuit, which is gonna use the Venturi part of the carburetor. So I have a off, an idle and an off idle system. And that's what you're typically controlling with your mixture screws. Nice. So let's look at some real carburetors. So it really starts to put, we can really put it together. Um, because this diagram lines up with the Rochester from a 1950 Chevy, but it's likely that you're, that's not the carburetor that you guys have. So um, we'll try to get this back to the document camera. Boom. So <clears throat> got my Elda Brock right here. And you can see that that baby has a couple of big old screws on there. Um, these are my idle mixture screws. Now, <clears throat> this carburetor, by the way, guys, this is an Elderbrock 1407 or 4260. It says right here on the bottom tag, four barrel carburetor, right? As four passages to flow air in the engine, four barrel carburetor. Um, and it's basically an evolution of the old Carter four barrel design. So a Carter carburetor from the 1970s. That's basically this carburetor. 
you might look at it and go, well, wait a minute. It says Elderbrock on the side here. Oh, you guys can't, can't read that, but on the side, there it is. You'll see um, uh, Marinelli and you'll see Weber. That's the Weber logo. Weber is, is owned by these guys. And basically they're the ones that build this carburetor. Um, and you, the Weber logo is on top of it here again. But it's, it's an evolution of an old Carter carburetor design. Um, so idle mixture screws right here in the front. Now remember I said the fuel goes from the float bowls through passages past the idle mixture screws and then it gets discharged below the throttle plate. We should see some passages then below the throttle plate. So if I turn this over, and I'll even zoom in there, try to focus this thing, you'll see that that port right there and that port right there those are my idle discharge ports. In fact, if I screwed in my mixture screw, I'm going to screw this one all the way in. Probably going to be hard for you guys to. Oh, you uh, you can kind of see it more. I screwed this side all the way in, and if you look right down in here you'll see like a little brass colored tip and that brass colored tips looks like it's, it's closer to the surface than this one. Cause that one I didn't screw in. Right. So those are the tapered ends of my mixture screws. Now what I'm going to do is I'll take the carburetor and I'm really screwing up the adjustments on this one. I'll take my, take my carburetor and I will, take this idle mixture screw out. All right, so you can see how the mixture screw is tapered at the end. Now, if I flip this guy back over and we look at you'll see that there's the mixture screw in that one right there but it's missing from that side because I took the mixture screw out. So based on that, guys, if I screw the mixture screw all the way in, all the way down, what's that going to do to the amount of fuel coming out of my idle circuit? You guys tell me. It's going to make it a lot leaner. It's gonna yeah, it's going to make it a lot leaner, right? You're, you're physically pinching <laughs> off the fuel flow, right? The fuel yes, comes out of that little port from the bottom. I'm just putting my mixture screw back in and the fuel comes out of these little tiny ports. And as I screw the screw in, right, I turn it clockwise, it actually comes in there and it pinches off the fuel flow. Um, now in the diagram I showed you, I also uh, uh, told you about off idle ports or transfer ports. See how there's that little slit right there. And if I open up the throttle more, I'm uncovering that little slit. Nice. Okay. That's your off idle port. And I, I must have the idle speed set pretty high on this carburetor. I did run this on an engine. This, oh, sorry guys, it's hard to get everything on the screen that you want to get on. Um, this screw right here, this is my idle speed screw. And so if I unscrew this thing, it basically is going to let the throttle close more and that's how I control the minimum speed of my engine is what position are the throttle plates in. So as I'm closing, as I'm allowing the, the, the throttle to close, and part of what's limiting me is, is now you can look at it and guess what? There's none of the transfer, uh, transfer ports or off idle ports are, are uncovered, right? They're totally blocked off because now I'm letting the throttle close completely. So as I start to open up the throttle, then I start to uncover the off idle ports and deliver more and more fuel to the engine until I have this thing opened up enough that I have enough airflow 
to get those venturis down inside the center of the carburetor to come on and start working. So hopefully that makes some sense, right? In fact, that lines up pretty well with this picture on the screen. Can you guys see the picture again? Right, that's, that's all fine and well. And remember, we, as we turn the screw in, we are pinching off the fuel flow. So we lean it out as we turn the screw clockwise. If we unscrew the screw, unless the screw actually falls out and then it's sucking air in there, if we unscrew the screw, it will allow more fuel to come out and that will make it richer, right? That's how most carburetors work, okay? In fact, I got two more carburetors that I wanna show you. So again, document camera and oops, I gotta erase some scribbles. So let's do that. Okay. Um, well, here we go. Small engine carburetor. So, and I'll put the float bowl back on it so it looks more like a complete carburetor. So I have two screws here. This is my idle speed screw, guys. And so if I... Sorry for being late. I just woke up. All right, Nathan. It's good to have you here. <laughs> this you can, you can watch the video. Um, I will tell you i will share a funny story with you guys like well then again i, I don't know about you I, I know some of you guys are still working and um but it's this is a weird situation that we're in and so like it's hard to even know like well what what day is it sometimes i'll, I'll wake up and i'll think oh it's saturday no it's not it's wednesday i had a webinar that i was going to take this week on uh process pro which is some of our engine management software and I missed the, the thing and I signed up for it myself and I still missed it because I missed that it was at 12 o'clock central time, not 12 o'clock Pacific time. So um, it, we're, we're in a, a weird operation. So remember that with all of our presentations, I will, I'm recording them and I'm posting them um, on, uh, uh, on our Canvas website at a later date. So Nathan, we're looking at these two screws on the side of a carburetor. And this is one of the little carburetors similar to what you have on some of your little bikes and stuff. Um, this one's off of a Honda clone engine. So it's a copy of a Honda carburetor. And this screw right here is my idle speed screw. But this screw right here is my idle mixture screw. And so again, if I look at where it would come in, remember that the, the throttle plate is not in this carburetor. I took it out so you could see it better but you can see the end of the idle mixture screw poking out of the idle passage right there. I and wish you I, had uh, mine. I, I don't you, have mine, your carburetor. Yeah. Cause yeah, I, my, mine's unique. It has a, a knob instead of a screw. So it's much easier to change the mixture. So again, as a, as I unscrew this screw, it's going to richen up the mixture. And if I screw the screw in, it's going to lean out the mixture. And that's how most carburetors are. So you can see that working. What about the off idle passages? Well, if I look at this little carburetor, if I can angle this just right, see how there's like four little tiny holes right there? Those mm -hmm. are my off idle ports, super small. You, if, you, if you're wondering, hey, why do I always have carburation issues on my small engines? The passages in my small engine carburetors are just that they're smaller. So it's easier for them to get clogged up full of junk. And so that's why fuel quality and cleanliness and freshness is so important, especially on your small engine stuff. All right. So all these were so conventional. But I do have a question. Should I run in a uh, fuel filter on my bike? Yes. Run a fuel filter. And if it's going to sit around, run some fuel stabilizer in the fuel. Okay. There might even be some in the tank, little filters. The pet yeah, tank. a lot of times there is little filter screens on top of your pet cock in the tank, but an external fuel filter is always a, a good idea. All right, so everything is lined up exactly with my pictures in the presentation until now. Um, 
if I look at my Holly carburetor, there's no mixture screws <clears throat> on the bottom of this thing. But wait a minute. It's got some screws right here on the sides on my metering plate. Well, what are those about? And if you read the manual for the Holly carburetor, what you'll find is that these screws work the opposite. So remember that traditionally, if I can get the thing to stay just like that, um, on a regular carburetor, if I screwed the screw in, what would it do to the mixture, guys? Would it make it run richer or leaner? Leaner. Yes. But on a Holly, it does the opposite. What? So if I screw this screw in, it actually makes this carburetor on under idle conditions, low speed conditions, it makes it run richer. Because on this carburetor, it's not controlling a, a screw that is going with the idle fuel discharge. It's actually controlling the, air, the idle air bleed passageway. This block on a Holly is called your metering block. It's kind of a neat design how they put all the metering type stuff in there. So I have my float bowl, accelerator pump, metering block. Oop, there it goes. Um, is that a double pumper? It's not, it's not a double pumper. Because oh. um, it would have two accelerator pumps. So here's my accelerator pump diaphragm. I would have another one back here. Um, uh, 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 with with a double pumper set up, so it's not a double pumper. In fact, this carburetor is one that I bought um, from Racing Beat that is supposedly retuned to run on a rotary engine. So this is our our rotary engine Holly carb, and I have a matching manifold for it at the shop to throw it on a on a rotary and see what it would. What it would do. Real quick, do you have any aftermarket uh, size for like a 5.0 that you might want to get rid of, or maybe I'll text you about? Or no? Yeah, you, you can you can text me about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um. So let me get out of the document camera. Okay. There we go. And if we look at this thing, um, oh, uh, the Holly carburetor, and Nathan, a lot of your um, small engine stuff will work the same way. Instead of the mixture screw being down here, it's not. They put the mixture screw, yeah, well, I'll just draw it going out over here in the side. Um, they put the mixture screw up here and it's controlling the idle air bleed. Now the idle air bleed allows air to mix in with the fuel, right? So if I pinch off the air bleed, it basically makes it richer because it doesn't allow the air to mix in with the fuel. So it's another way to do that. A lot of your motorcycle carburetors work the same way. Their idle mixture isn't controlling the fuel flow directly, it's controlling the air bleed. And on a motorcycle, they're likely to not um, call this thing. Professor, on mine, mine's supposed to have an, an upgraded carb. It's like a flat, si flat slide 40. Are you familiar yeah. with that or? Yeah. So, uh, so, so most of your motorcycle carburetors are variable Venturi carburetors. Okay. And that they have a, a slide that moves back and forth. Give me, give me just a second here. I was gonna type something. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, pilot air screw. All right. So on a, um, on a motorcycle, they have a slide that comes in and that basically can move. Yes, this is looking really ugly, but it can move in or out and it can vary the size of the Venturi. Oh. Right? 
It can vary the size of the Venturi. This and those slides traditionally model. were round. Um, as you get to more modern motorcycle carburetors, those slides are flat. So when you say you got a flat slide, it means that this, this sliding piece, this variable Venturi is flat and it's not round. Um, and then they'll go, you know, how many millimeters is it? Remember the idea is that the bigger it is, the bigger the Venturi area, the more air can flow through the carburetor and more power you can make. Um, you ever hogged one out? Uh, I have. Um, and what usually happens again is that you, lo you lose like low speed drivability, but you gain high speed performance. Um, in fact, I think that's one of the things that really hurts our, um, our little uh, RX-7 is that it, it probably just is too restricted by the Venturi area of the carburetor. Anyways, um, regarding the motorcycle carburetors and the Hollies and, uh, and their, their idle mixture, oops, wrong, wrong eraser. Um, you, you have to look at where is the, um, where is the mixture screw at? If the mixture screw is at the bottom, it's probably conventional. If the mixture screw is more like on the side of the carburetor, it's probably controlling the idle air bleed, okay? And on a motorcycle carburetor, they'll call it something like your pilot air screw. Because instead of calling it the idle system, on a lot of motorcycles, they like to call it the pilot system, okay? So those two th terms mean the same stupid thing. But um, so, and you'll see motorcycles, car, you know, if, if this idle mixture screw is up higher or, uh, higher or pilot air screw, it's controlling the air bleed and that means it works in the opposite direction. There is one thing in common for the, ho the, the screws on the side of the Holly or the ones on the front of the Elderbrock or is that idle stuff is going to be more low speed. Namely, lower amounts of air flowing through the engine, lower speed of the engine, it has less air going through it. So we're not really utilizing the Venturi of the carburetor yet, okay? So if you're concerned about your air fuel mixture at wide open throttle, these screws are not gonna affect wide open throttle performance really. I mean, maybe a little bit, but definitely not significantly amount, maybe not even at all. I have uh, a question. Yeah, go ahead. When I disassembled my carburetor, there was only one jet in there when it should have at least two from what at least I saw. Uh, that's a good, that's a good uh, observation. It's a good question. Um, dang it. You know what I didn't grab is a real good motorcycle carburetor. Um, I'll tell you what, Nathan, let me switch slides here. And what we're going to do is we are going to go to the next slide, which is the main metering system. And in the main good. metering slide here, you can see it talks about having a uh, main jet. Yeah, there should be a main jet and a pilot jet. Right. And so think Even of my, the pilot jet, use that term jet interchangeably jet with the idle, right? Think of that as an idle jet or a low speed jet. So you have a low speed jet and a high speed jet. So you might just have a different carburetor that, um, you know, doesn't have, uh, doesn't have an idle jet for whatever reason, and it only has a main metering jet. If I move this thing back to my document camera and I get that guy out of the way, I did grab, this was a little tiny carburetor off of a, a Comer 50 go-kart engine. And um, this screw on the side actually was your, your idle speed screw because it, it raised and lowered the, um, the slide this carburetor had uh, kind of a, like a semi-flat slide. You can see how it poked in there, like one half of it was curved and the other half was flat. 
and that screw would raise or lower the slide. But if I look at it, it's only got one pickup here. That means it has only a, a, a main metering jet. If I go to my Honda clone carburetor, take off the float bowl, what you can see is that, um, again, I have a, a, a main metering jet in here uh, only for this one, and I don't have a pilot jet. But what I will do is I'm going to get you out. Here's, here's one of my uh, jet kits. And let's see if I can. One thing about mine, it had a set of extra jets, but none of them really fit in it. Huh. So if I open this up, this is for, I want to say this was for my carburetor on my 80 shifter. Um, but I can't remember if, if it was my Keenan carburetor or my Makuni carburetor. Um, but you can see we had a lot of different jets in there, right? Might need some of those. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> what, what are we doing with these jets? Well, um, the, um, the little tiny ones, basically I had um, idle jets and then the bigger ones, I had my main metering jets. And then I also have different, um, different uh, needles here that I could change inside that thing. So if you're really trying to tune this thing, I even had some different um, uh, E-tubes and, and stuff on here. So, um, and different uh, pilot jets. So, so that would be a pilot jet. Then I got a bunch of different main metering jets. Um, Basically, let me go back to the, to the, uh, Hey guys, you got yeah. a job scheduled for 12. I'll catch you guys later. I'll watch the rest later. Thank okay. You. Sounds, sounds really good, Frank. And I'm glad to hear that you got a job scheduled. So that's, that's good. Go make some money. All right. You Thanks get it. guys. All right. Um, all right. So we were doing, uh, and then, you know what, that kind of clues me in that I need to, I need to start moving a little faster because <laughs> um, uh, I did want to try to wrap things up by, by about noon because I don't want to be killing you guys. Um, so what's the deal with the, um, what's the deal with these jets? What's going on? Well, this jet is a restriction point for the fuel so that when it's going from the float bowl, into the main well area, it's, a, it's just that, it's a restriction point. So if I make the jet bigger, more fuel can flow from the fuel bowl, float bowl into the main well, and then can be discharged out the main nozzle, that's gonna richen up the mixture. If I put a smaller jet in, well, that's gonna restrict the fuel entering the main well, and that's gonna lean out the mixture, right? Do you see how there's two pickups here inside the main well? There's two pickups inside the main well. Um, there's one here for the idle circuit and there's one here for my main metering. So if I were to take those uh, jets and I could put one on my idle pickup tube and I could put another jet on my main metering pickup tube, then I could have a main jet and I can have an idle jet or a pilot jet is what they would call that in a motorcycle carburetor, okay? It, the idea is that it gives you a, one more thing that you can tune for your part throttle response and your idle mixture, okay? So if you couldn't adjust your idle mixture well enough on a motorcycle carburetor with your uh, pilot air screw, then you would change your pilot jet. Remember that idle and pilot systems are low speed, okay? Once we get to higher speed, we're going to be running on main metering, okay? Um, so main metering, fuel goes from the float bowl through the main metering jet, gets picked up through the, the, um, the, the main pickup uh, and it passes some air bleeds. This is often called like the emulsion, emulsion tube or, or E-tube as it 
passes some air bleeds and it starts getting chopped up with air and then it gets discharged out the main nozzle and delivered into the incoming airstream. And this is where we're taking advantage of that venturi, right? This narrowing area of the carburetor causes the airflow to speed up as it speeds up to go through that narrow passage. And this one actually has a little boost venturi right here. As, it, as the airflow speeds up, it creates a pressure drop. It's that pressure drop or low pressure here that causes the fuel to want, even wanna go from the float bowl through the main jet and then into the airstream, right? So it takes a considerable amount of airflow to make the main metering system work. And that's why we had to have that idle and off idle system to get up to main metering speeds. So remember, when it comes to carburetor sizing, if, um, you know, if I have a carburetor that is too small, this Venturi area is gonna act as a restriction and limit how much power the engine's gonna make. Um, but then again, if the Venturi area is too big, it's not gonna create an adequate pressure drop and the car is gonna run really poorly uh, until you really, you know, floor it and get a lot of airflow through here to make a decent pickup signal to pull the fuel out of there. So choosing the right carburetor is, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a balancing act between drivability and then all out performance. So Jonathan had a question um, saying yeah. that um, if, say he has a 24 millimeter carb and the 26 millimeter carb, um, and the jet is 26, wouldn't that mean the carbon must be bigger or does it have to be smaller? Uh, say, say the question again, and is it, on the, is it on the chat or something? Yeah, it's on the chat. Okay, I had closed the chat because I was running out of screen space. Um, where is it? There it is. Okay, 24 millimeter carb and a 26 millimeter carb. The the jet in the 26 millimeter carb is bigger? I would say that yes, typically, but not necessarily. Um, you tune your jetting based on what, you, what your engine's doing, right? Like you take your spark plugs out, you look at them. If the spark plugs are really dark, then you may have it jetted too rich. Um, so why, why did I have so many if I switch this back to the document camera, oh gosh, I got to get rid of all these scribbles or some, as many of them as I can get rid of here. Um, why do I have so many crazy jets here? And then for other carburetors, I have other jets and other jets and other jets. Well, um, so that I can dial in my air fuel ratio for what, what's going on with that engine, right? Because with this carburetor like this, I don't have my oxygen sensor telling my computer what to do. I can't automatically adjust. It comes down to me as the tuner to select the right jets and that's how I can set up my air fuel ratio. So you could have a bigger carburetor on there and maybe it would have a bigger jet in it or you might end up running the same jet you had in the smaller carburetor because your engine's running too rich with the bigger jet. This gets me to numbers on the jets. I pulled that jet out. I'm going to see if I can zoom in on him. And see if we can get this thing to focus. And we'll erase these scribbles. Hey, now we're almost seeing some numbers. Try it one more time. This jet says 180 on the side. All right, so jets will typically be stamped with different sizes. Here's my lesson for you guys, is that sometimes the jets will lie to you. I can have two jets that are stamped 180 and guess what? If I actually measure their sizes, they could measure out at different sizes. So the next piece of carburetor 
tomfoolery here is a pin gauge set. The pin gauge set allows me to put these pins through my jets and actually figure out how big they are in thousandths of an inch. So if I take my dial caliper here, and you can tell I, I like this quite a bit. It's, it's where like precision measurement and carburetor tuning is all coming together. This guy is reading right at 20 thousandths. I know you guys can't exactly see that on the screen, but that's a 20 thousandths gauge, right? If I spilled all these out of, out of this, this um, yeah, kind of like a feeler gauge. Yep, yep, Charlie. Um, if I spill all these out, I got to actually mic each one. And then basically what I do is I, as I put them through my jets. Now, looks like I labeled these 36, 37. So I'm going to grab a 37 pin gauge and that should go through that jet. In theory, if I did this correctly. Yep, it doesn't fit through that one because that's a 36. So jets will be size different sizes. What I have found the hard way is that because of manufacturing tolerances, sometimes jets are stamped one thing, but they really measure out something else. And so I will manually set up my jets and label them and pin them. So if you're really doing, you know, kind of what I'll call more high level engine tuning and trying to get your air fuel mixture right where you want it, you're going to be changing jets because as atmospheric pressures change, uh, in elevation or, or air density changes with, with temperature or weather conditions, this is what I have to do to adjust my carburetor for that. Um, I need to know what sizes those jets really are. So this is a pin gauge set and there's pin gauges for small jets. There's pin gauges for big jets. Okay, so um, back to Jonathan's question, it would really just depend on what um, what the engine needed. You might end up where that engine runs best with the bigger carburetor that's kind of jetted down with the smaller jet. Now I'm gonna take the jet out of this carburetor and I wanna point out a couple of things for you guys on it. One thing I want you to notice is look at my screwdriver. It's got flat sides. This is actually a jet screwdriver made so that it doesn't mess up the threads on the side of that. Here's my jet. Here is my emulsion tube. My emulsion tube has a bunch of holes because that's where we're mixing some air in with the fuel. And the end of this emulsion tube is actually my main nozzle that goes out in the center of the Venturi. In fact, if I take the E-tube or emulsion tube and I set them back in there and I look inside the carburetor, that's the end of my emulsion tube right in the, in the center of this carburetor. So that functions as my main discharge nozzle. All right. Hey, what, uh, what size? What size is that jet? I don't know. I would use my pin gauge because my I can't read what was stamped on there. And like I said, sometimes it will be stamped one thing and it's really something else. So I'm going to grab a 37, 37 fits, 38, 38 fits. Felt pretty good too. Um, 39, 39 doesn't fit. So uh, this jet. This is jetted to 38 thousandths. And then I would see how my engine ran from there. So, um, all right. So hopefully that makes sense as far as the tuning uh, of there. So um, Jonathan says, uh, let's see, we, uh, we had 26 carb on the 150. And I'm assuming that it it, uh, it, it made it run a little rich. So you put the bigger carburetor on, maybe it was jetted differently. You could then, whoop, my jet got away from me, but you could then switch jets and maybe jet that carb down and get it to run with the correct air fuel mixture. But when you went to wide open throttle, that bigger carburetor would allow more air in the engine 
and, and it should make more power, right? So that's where the tuning um, comes into play, guys. Okay, so let's see here, I got. So would I have to replace the jet on my car so it wouldn't have power just completely <sighs> through? Yeah, I think, well, what I would try to do is first, if, if, the, if it's running crappy at low speeds, see if you can adjust your idle mixture, right? Well, it's Through your idle mixture screw crappy. or your pilot it's air just... screw. And then if that doesn't work, you're gonna have to start changing jets. But remember, what are we assuming here? We are assuming that like your float level is correct. Remember the float affects all the other systems. So if the float was misadjusted or if the float itself had a leak in it and it was sunk to the bottom of the, of course that would screw everything up. But assuming the float is good, the air bleeds and, and, and bowl vents and stuff are all good. What you would start doing is start uh, playing around with the jets to uh, get the mixture where you want it. And that's why you can see I got a zillion jets laying here because you kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of trial and error um, of where you, where you want to go, where you need to go. I mean, there's different calculators. In fact, hang, hang tight real fast. Well, I couldn't find. I thought I had my um, my jet calculator, and this is my just numbers converter. But they make little calculated calculation charts of what jets to use when. But basically, um, Nathan, you got to make a decision: Am I running too rich, or am I running too lean? Right? And you're going to make that determination by how do the spark plugs look. So. Last I checked, they looked fine. There was no fuel on them at all. Okay, so I know I got some scribbles on there, but well, here I got well, a spark plug. I won. And if I look at that electrode, it's pretty white, right? So you would say, hey, that, that, thing's, running, that thing's running lean, especially if it was like an air-cooled engine. We'd want, want something running richer. If it was um, a fuel-injected engine that has an oxygen sensor that can go in the closed loop. Well, it's going to look like it's on this lean side of things. But for something carbureted, I would say, hey, that thing's running lean. And I would want to pick jets that were bigger, right? I would want to increase the jet size. But if I looked at that spark plug and it, this was all black, right? It was really dark colored. I would want to decrease the jet size because it was running too rich. So it really depends on how, how do your spark plugs look and, and going from there. If it's like a dirt bike or something, I want my spark plug electro to look kind of kind of caramel or like a, like a um, I don't know, Starbucks uh, cappuccino or coffee with a lot of cream in it, that kind of light coffee caramel color. That's how I would want something like a sm uh, high performance small engine to look. Also, Is there is there a reason why, uh, without getting on the throttle, when I did get to shift into gear and uh, not die on me, it would just sit at like 20 miles an hour? Or like it was staying revved up all the time? Like, no matter what I did before I got on the throttle, it was always cruising around like 10 to 20. Um, maybe something wasn't letting the, th the throttle slide to close down all the way. I mean, well, first I would go through all the adjustments. I, I would note down what jets are in it, right? I would pin them out. Like what size jets do I have in this thing? Then I would go through all the adjustments and I kind of go from there. When and I looked at the slide, the, the slide would go all the way to the bottom and there'd be like, say like, a sixteenth of an inch crack that you'd see through, but I didn't know if that was normal or not. Yeah, so it um, it depends, and the carburetor I had here didn't have a um, doesn't have a slide in it. But um, what I think is that the slide wasn't closing enough. 
or your other option would be that there's um, a vacuum leak there that's letting air go in the engine and not have to go through the center of the carburetor. So it would, you know, it would just, it would take some inspection and diagnosis. That's, that's for sure to figure out what's, what's going on. Yeah, and we can't do that until we get back into the yeah. garage. But you know, at least it's at least it's hopefully it's all starting to come together. You you kind of have the idea now of well, what things do I want to look at? I want to look and make sure that there's no vacuum leaks. I want to make sure that the throttle is closing um, completely or as completely as I can make it close, right? All right. Um, so again, the main metering system, uh, works by, oh, my internet connection is unstable. I got too, too many people at home on the internet, maybe. Um, the main metering system works by this Venturi effect of necking down the airflow or, or neck, necking down the area inside the center of the carburetor. Um, somebody early had um, uh, somebody early had asked me about hogging out carburetors. And you'll see this, like I wanna make more power. I take a big drill and I, I rod out this Venturi area. Well, guess what? This thing's gonna be able to flow more airflow. The Venturi is not gonna act as a restriction. But what happens when I do that? I lose all like my part throttle, lower speed um, drivability, because now the, the main metering system is not going to work correctly. It's not going to work as smoothly because it's too big for my engine's condition at running at low speeds. So it really is somewhat of a compromise. And again, that's going to be an advantage that a fuel injection system is going to have over a uh, carburetor is that it's going to be able to provide you the right air fuel mixture a little bit better over the entire operating range. Okay. We'll go to the next slide here. Power enrichment. So we're, we're almost done here. Power enrichment system is, um, power enrichment is basically a, a way for us to adjust the air fuel mixture uh, when we're running down the road. And that is, um, if I wanna make a bunch of power, my question for you guys is, do I wanna go rich or do I want to go lean? Lean is mean. Lean is mean, which way is, so lean would be good at high RPM, but you have the risk of doing what? Burning stuff up, right? Burning up. So typically, if you want to make power safely, you're going to want to be richer, okay? So if I richen up the mixture, um, that can help keep the engine sp safe when I ask a lot of horsepower from it. What if you just want to switch out the engine every single run? Sure, sure. But let's say you're just driving your street car, you're going down the road, and all of a sudden, you go to merge on the freeway and everybody on the freeway is going like 80 miles an hour. So you gotta go to wide open throttle, the hammer's down. I want the mixture to go a little bit richer. So what the power enrichment system or power system does is it either has a power valve here or it might have a metering rod, but basically it's almost like I'm opening up an extra jet. I'm opening up an extra passageway to get fuel from the float bowl up into and through the main metering system. So a lot of carburetors will do that through a power valve. Like Holly's use a power valve. A lot of your Ford carburetors use a power valve. Um, that's how they do it. Other carburetor designs, what they'll do for their power enrichment system is they will use a metering rod going in and out of a jet. So if I erase my scribbles here, and I again, throw this thing back onto my document camera, and I get my handy dandy jet kit out, 
you notice that I had three different rods in here. If I take one of these metering rods, you'll notice that it's tapered and it's tapered to fit inside this jet. And it's set up mechanically so that as I open up the throttle, I pull the metering rod out of the jet and it's almost like it makes the jet bigger, right? It can flow more fuel. Hey, now you can see the numbers on that jet. That's a 160. So um, another version of a power enrichment system is to use metering rods going in and out of the jets. So they'll either use a power valve or they'll use different metering rods. And so you can adjust how rich the engine is gonna go with its power enrichment system. That being said, a lot of carburetor designs, especially those on smaller engines, will not have a power enrichment system on them, okay? But your more sophisticated carburetor designs do. So, power enrichment gives you a little bit of extra fuel as you get to wide open throttle conditions, and it either uses metering rods going in and out of the jets, or it uses a power valve. Um, what I figured I would do here, and I, I do encourage you guys, um, if you look at that Elderbrock uh, tuning deal, they'll talk about switching things. On this Elderbrock, you know, it, it has some, some cool features to it. One of the neat features is that I can mess around with my metering rods without taking apart the whole carburetor. So you see I'm pulling this screw out of here. I'll take that cap off of there. And there's my metering rod that would go in and out of the jet. You can see it's got a lot of little spring underneath him. And what controls this guy? Well, it's got this little piston and it has vacuum going to the bottom of the piston. So essentially, instead of being mechanically operated with linkage, he's controlled by vacuum, and that controls the position of the metering rod going in and out of the jet. The other thing I could do, as far as controlling the circuit, like tuning it, is I could put in different metering rods, right? I could possibly put in different springs there, right? A stiffer spring would um, come up come up a little sooner, so it would take less vacuum signal to to um, it, it would take more vacuum signal to depress it. So there, you can see that when you get into engine tuning, when you're dealing with carburetors, man, there's a lot of tuning that can happen right there at the carburetor, right? And um, if you're racing in a series that requires you to use a carburetor, uh, you know, there's, there's definitely time to be had by being able to properly adjust the carburetor and get you the right air fuel mixture, right? So um, that's one of the kind of the neat features of this carburetor design. All right. Um, let's get back to the computer. So that's the power enrichment system. Accelerator pump system, or just the pump system as it's called right here. Well, what happens is when I open up the throttle quickly, I get a big gulp of air that goes in the engine pretty darn fast. Well, the fuel, because it weighs more, the fuel lags behind. And so if you quickly open up the throttle on your engine, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna get a stumble or a hesitation on acceleration because the mixture is gonna momentarily go lean. And it can go so lean that, hey, may, maybe this thing even stalls out on you. So the accelerator pump is actually connected to linkage, to the throttle linkage, and it is just that. It's a physical pump that plunges or pumps a little bit of fuel from the float bowl through a discharge check ball and into the Venturi area of the carburetor. And so when you quickly open up the throttle, 
This thing squirts some fuel in there that mixes with the air so that the mixture does not go lean and the engine accelerates smoothly. So if you have a carbureted engine that hesitates on acceleration, the first thing I would go to look for is my accelerator pump system and make sure it's not working right. Um, that being said, a lot of your motorcycle carburetors and basically your smaller carburetors, they may not need an accelerator pump on a real small carburetor, but as the carburetor gets larger, there's more need for an accelerator pump. So you're more likely to see it on, on a carburetor that is there to, to feed a bigger engine, okay? So you kind of see how it works. Oh, why do you guys think that it has this little check ball inside the circuit there? What do you guys think? Isn't it to regulate the fuel? By... Uh, yeah, I mean, kind of. Um, well, okay, let me, let me pose the question a different way. Let's say I went to rebuild the carburetor, and by the way, I've, I've done this very mistake, and guess what? I, uh, I forgot that little check ball. I forgot to put them in there. And so I left them out, and I put it together. What would that do to the way this thing ran? Wouldn't it make it a lot richer or lean? It out would, it? because now it would just start sucking fuel, the Venturi system, right? The, the main metering system through the low pressure created through the Venturi would just suck a bunch of extra fuel through the, the accelerator pump system. What would happen so that if fuel, that, that check ball is there to make sure that he comes off his seat and lets fuel go through him from pressure from this side but it doesn't just let vacuum suck fuel through the accelerator pump circuit, okay? So if you leave it out, your car ends up running way too rich. So uh, that's why when you take apart a carburetor and you're like, hey, there's little steel BBs in here. What was that? Well, that was your accelerator pump discharge check ball and go find it and put it back where it goes. Um, so, yep, that's what uh, that's there for. Let's look at- question. Yeah, go ahead. What would happen if you forgot to put the check balls back in like the valve body of a transmission? Well, okay, so that's a different thing. <laughs> but um, likely what's gonna happen is the it's either not gonna shift or it will shift into one gear, but it won't shift into the next gear. Or maybe it will shift up, but then it won't downshift properly. Basically that lets, that, that kind of like the accelerator pump check valve did is it, it acts as a one-way uh, fluid direction right it lets the fluid move in one direction and not the other so you can get a whole host of symptoms it depends on what transmission you have and how that valve body is put together so let's just go out on a limb and say hey when you got little uh check balls and stuff there's a reason the engineers put the, those in there it, it is important and if you leave them out you're going to cause problems all right um so I'm going to do the next system. This is our last system. This is the choke system. And then we'll look at both choke and accelerator pump on some real carburetors. The choke is there just to do that. It's going to choke off the airflow when the engine is cold. And this choke could be manually operated by you, the operator, right? There's a choke knob you got to pull or you got to manually flip a lever. Or it could be automatically controlled with some type of thermostatic coil spring that might be electrically assisted or it might not be electrically assisted. It could be, sometimes you'll see these, they'll run coolant through the choke housings. Um, Speaking of electric exhaust. Did yeah, you so, ever get the, the stuff for the Model A? Uh, nope. Like, well, I got some stuff, but then I got stymied. So let's talk about this thermostatic coil, okay? The thermostatic coil has, is wound with a metal that is two different types of metal sandwiched together. And each type of metal expands at a different rate. So as I heat this up and cool it down, let's say that the red side here expands and contracts more, right? What that's gonna do is as this thing heats up, it's gonna wanna straighten out. And as it cools down, it's gonna wanna coil up, right? So that could just, I could just allow my normal heating and cooling of the engine to expand or contract the thermostatic coil, 
but a lot of times these are going to be assisted electrically like I'll pump some electricity through this coil to have it heat up faster and I'll have a greater effect on it or I might run coolant in there. The idea is that when the engine is cold this coil is contracted and it pulls the lever down and closes the choke. So think about how you start your old carbureted car. You, you walk up to it in the morning and you jump in that car and you pump the accelerator maybe two times or heck, maybe you pumped it five times. When you, every time you pump the accelerator, accelerator uh, pedal, the gas pedal, the accelerator pump squirted a little bit of fuel from the float bowl. It squirted that down in the engine to help prime the engine. That or also allowed the thermostatic coil here to then move the carburetor linkage and basically close off the choke valve. So you prime the engine and you let the choke close. And if the choke's adjusted right, it'll close the right amount. And now you go to fire up your car and it fires up and runs. As soon as the engine started to make vacuum, that vacuum would be applied to maybe a vacuum choke pull off right here and it would open up the choke just a little bit because it pulled on it there to keep it from running too rich. So that would be this, this in this picture basically you have the, the, the makings of an automatic choke system, right? A manual choke system, I would control what position the chokes in myself manually. And I had people that would say, hey, my car's not running right. And I looked at it and they're driving around with the choke on too much. Um, or, hey, my engine won't start. Oh, well, you didn't actually put the choke on, so you can't get the mixture rich enough to, to make it run. Now, why do we even need a choke system? Well, remember, fuel has to be turned into a vapor, right? How do we get the fuel to turn into a vapor? Well, we do that from heat from the engine and also the low pressure in the engine from the vacuum that's created on the engine, uh, the intake stroke. So when the engine's cold, guess what, man? I don't have any heat there. And so I literally have to close off the airflow and that will get enough fuel pouring down the intake that some of that fuel will turn into a vapor and it'll start burning. Once the engine fires up, it starts making heat and then I can start taking the choke off. So even a fuel injected engine, is gonna need a heck of a lot more fuel flow when it's cold because it doesn't have the heat there to vaporize the fuel. Couldn't you and also use... compensate for that by just dumping a hell of a lot more fuel in the engine, some of it will turn into a vapor. It will vaporize, we'll burn it. Once we start burning it, we start making heat and then we can start pinching back the fuel flow. So that's, that's the job of the choke system. And if I choke off the airflow, it's going to then pull, uh, pull a lot more fuel through all those carburetor circuits. Um, so, you know, it's... I, I had a question. Basic. Go ahead. Couldn't you also use like a, a heater or like an engine heater to warm it up in the morning? Uh, you could. In fact, some engines would have like a little electric grid almost like a little space heater that would sit underneath the carburetor in the intake manifold uh, to help that. They would also suck hot air off of the exhaust manifold and direct that up to the air cleaner to get all this stuff to heat up faster. Um, there's a, a variety of different, um, different designs. Um, all right, so here I got my carburetor sitting here and this is my choke valve and you notice the choke valves open. I get to it in the morning. I open up the throttle a couple times. That allows the choke to close and it also gives me a couple shots of fuel from the accelerator pump. This choke valve, by the way, has a little valve in there. So if the engine backfires, it can relieve the pressure. That's what that little valve's there for. That's kind of a neat feature. Um, so what kind of choke is on this carburetor? Here's my thermostatic coil. It's in this plastic cap and it's got some wires going to it. This is an electrically assisted choke. How do I adjust how much the choke is going to choke? See how I have this little line right here and I have these lines here. 
if I loosen the housing by moving these screws, I can rotate it one way or the other to make the choke close more or close less, right? Be open a little bit more. And that will control how much enrichment the choke system provides. The choke system also does one more thing, guys. If I look at the side, what you'll notice is the choke has some linkage here. It locks out the secondaries from operating when I'm, when I'm running with the choke on. And it also moves over here and it ends up actuating the fast idle cam. So there's a idle speed screw that operates off of this choke fast idle cam. As I take the choke off, then it doesn't touch anything. So that's why your engine will run at a faster speed with the choke on. It actually increases the idle speed to help it run a little smoother and help it not stall out. So you have a separate idle speed screw when the, when the engine's running with the choke on and that's your fast idle cam and your fast idle speed screw or your, or your, your, um, your idle speed with the choke on. So um, your cold idle. So regular idle speed, cold idle speed that's running off the fast idle cam. What about that accelerator pump? Do you see this link right here coming from the throttle linkage up to this guy right here? Guess what? That's, that's my accelerator pump right there. And you can see so it mechanically moves and it controls my accelerator pump discharge. Notice that this carburetor has some adjustments there. I could select one of these three different locations to get more or less pumpage from the accelerator pump and make that accelerator pump stroke stronger or, or weaker. So I have some tuning there that I can do for my accelerator pump to control how much fuel comes through the accelerator pump. Now, if I switch carburetors here and I go to this little guy, this guy doesn't, it's, it's too small. It doesn't need an accelerator pump. So there's no accelerator pump circuit. All right, well, what about the Holly? We know he has to have an accelerator pump. Here he is right here at the bottom. So it's got this big diaphragm style accelerator pump. And so as I move it, see how there's like a little plastic cam and that controls how the accelerator pump moves. I can actually ch change those little cams out of there to get more or less pump stroke. And then there's adjustments here on the accelerator pump as well. So kind of a little bit different design, but again, the accelerator pump is a very mechanical device and how it operates and it squirts a little shot of fuel down the primary barrels of the engine when I open up the throttle. Speaking of my barrels, this is a four barrel carburetor, right? It has my two primaries and then these two barrels on the back are called what? You guys help me out here. What are those things called? You can post it on the secondaries. Chat. Yeah, those are my secondaries. And notice that I went all the way wide open on this carburetor and I didn't get any secondary operation here. That's because on this carburetor, these secondaries are operated off this big diaphragm over here. These are vacuum operated secondaries. These are vacuum operated. And guess what? I can't open them right now because they were locked out. The choke was on, right? Now I can open up those vacuum operated secondaries. So I could have secondaries that are operated mechanic, uh, mechanically, or I can have them operated off a of vacuum. So if I take this carburetor away and I put our Elda brought that up on the screen. Again, four barrel carburetor. And here's my primaries, but on this guy, my secondaries are mechanically operated. See that? But what you'll notice is that there's kind of a kind of a hybrid in that. See how it's got these little butterflies in the top? Those little butterflies. So I got to get the put it the throttle to to open so I can even move those guys. These little butterflies in the top are operated off a of vacuum. So I could have, so it's, it's kind of, it has mechanically operated throttles down below, but it's got a throttle on the top that's controlled by vacuum. So I can have vacuum secondaries. I can have mechanical secondaries. Um, 
di the different advantages, disadvantages of each one. Um, I wanted to look at the holly. Here's my choke. Again, if I loosen those screws, I can turn this thing and make the choke richer or leaner. And this choke isn't electrically assisted. He's vacuum assisted. So I have a vacuum uh, port going off the side of that choke. So anyways, diff different designs, um, but kind of we're, we're trying to accomplish the same, the same thing. Um, this slide, I like it because it, it shows you like what circuit is in play at different vehicle speeds. But remember, it's all related to airflow, right? So as I open up the throttle more to go faster, you can see where the, um, where the different circuits are coming into play. Does that mean that that's always the case? Well, you know, if I just barely touch the throttle and I let the car slowly accelerate up, yeah, maybe I could get up to 25 miles an hour on the idle system. But if I floored it and I went to wide open throttle right off the bat, I'm gonna quickly go from idle to main metering to power because I'm commanding a lot of airflow through the engine. But it's kind of a nice slide in that it shows you kind of where the, the in, under normal driving, where the carburetor circuits come into play. So um, with that guys, what do you, what do you think? I have on here, no, if you know those six carburetor systems, it'll help you with not only diagnosing when the, when the a carbureted engine's not running right, but it'll also help you with your tuning and your adjustments, right? Like if I, if I have a car that's not running well at low speeds, I'm gonna go after my idle circuit or pilot circuit. If uh, I think it's lean at wide open throttle, well, I shouldn't be messing with the, with the idle speed mixture screws. I should be looking at my main jets, um, maybe my float level. Um, if it doesn't wanna start cold, I'm gonna be looking at what system. What do you guys think? I yep. think it's going fine. Yeah, the choke, the choke Yeah, choke system. So, so um, anyways, I've had a lot of people, when I finish this lecture, they go, wow, the, car the carburetor's way more complicated than I thought, right? Like, there's a, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. Well, yeah, there's, there's six systems um, in there for sure. Um, one thing Still I mean, more simple than a transmission or an engine. Yeah, and I will say this is that everything's inside the one carburetor, right? So you don't have sensors all over the darn engine and stuff. Everything's in the one unit. So what makes it simple is you could take that carburetor off and put another carburetor on. Or you take it off and you put it on the bench and rebuild it. So anyways, um, you know, it, it is simple in some respects and it can be complicated in other respects. And I do think if you were going to tune an engine to get good power from a carburetor, um, it does, you know, you do need to know what you're doing, right? So um, anyways, um, I hope you enjoyed this, this lecture uh, presentation. Um, it, again, it went a little bit longer than I thought, but um, I thought it was, it was pretty good. We got to cover a lot of stuff. You know what I did not do today is I did not relate it to, um, it's good to see you guys there. It's, I did not relate it to um, our flow bench testing stuff. We'll, we'll do that next week um, because I do have some, some gaskets and, and other things I wanted to show you and, and, and pull in how do the carburetors relate to readings you, you would have on the flow bench and why are these formulas a little bit different for each one um, we'll, we'll pull things all together uh, next week. And uh, we'll also be going into uh, how, do you, how do you calculate your engine's red line next week? Like what, how much RPM can you safely draw on that engine? Um, so if I put this back to our Canvas page, hopefully you guys can see the Canvas page. Um, I'll put a discussion up about carburetors. I'll ask you guys a few questions about them. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully this will this will help your understanding. If you guys throughout the week you're thinking about carburetors and you get some questions, be sure to to send those my way and 
have them pop up on my inbox here. I'd love to hear, uh, hear your questions and do my, do my, um, do my best to, to answer those. So with that, um, I, unless, do you guys have any questions for me uh, today? Right now, I can answer those real quick. Well, I, I was going to say to the red line thing, there gets to be a point when you just don't care and you just remove the rev limiter like me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And then and it, when it blows, it blows, right? Exactly. So, um, My pit bike doesn't have a rev limiter. Yep. Yep. And sometimes on some engines, you can get away with that and other, the other engines you can't. Um, I'm going to take it from the perspective of, let's say you're going to determine what your, what your red line is going to be, right? Like how you determine what the red line should be, right? Let's say you're like, well, I don't want my bike to blow up. Um, what, how much RPM can I safely rev up my engine to? That's what next week's lecture will be about. And then we'll also review some of this stuff. Uh, that I didn't get to today. So anyways, guys, um, thank you so much for uh, being with me today. I really appreciate it. Be sure to check out some of these other uh, resources and stuff. And if you have questions, be sure to, to send them my way. Um, I'm trying to get this thing back on my, on my face. I don't know where it went. So anyways, you guys have a great week. Uh, we'll see you next week. Everybody stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, keep uh, keep motoring on, okay? All right. Well, thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. All Bye right, for now. You.